Hello and welcome to this edition of SARPI Outlook, a program in which we seek to advance democratic ideals and candidates. My name is Randy Pryor and I'm very pleased to have as my guest on this program Chuck Hassebrook, Democratic candidate for governor of the state of Nebraska. I've asked Chuck here so that our viewers can get to know him a little better and as part of that we obviously will talk about the campaign and some of the major issues facing Nebraska. So a truly warm welcome to you, Chuck. Well, thanks for having me. It's great. Well, let's get right into it and start with a very basic question. Why Chuck Hasselbrook for governor of Nebraska? What is there in your background uh, and experience that you think makes you uniquely qualified to lead the state of Nebraska for the next four to eight years? Well, I mean, there are three critical things for governor. Um, one is education. Um, education policy is made at the state level. It's essential to our future. The second is economic development and business development. That's primarily a state responsibility. Um, and the third is making state government work. It's just running things, getting, getting budgets, balancing budgets, uh -huh. making things run well. I've had experience at all three. You know, my, I spent 18 years on the University of Nebraska Board of Regents. Right. And, and education is important to me. It's a life changer for me. And I'll never forget the value that education has had in my life. Um, my mom and dad were farm kids growing up during the Depression. They never had the chance to go to even the high school. Mm -hmm. for, so for me to have the opportunity to go to the University of Nebraska was a huge opportunity. Um, and so I saw it as a sacred responsibility to be on the Board of Regents and help guide that institution to ensure that we made higher education and a better life it provides accessible to all of our, and affordable to all of our people. Sure. Um, economic development was the core of my work at the Center for Rural Affairs. During the, the 17 years I led the Center for Rural Affairs, we helped 10,000 small businesses get started or grow with loans and training and help putting together business plans. Um, we helped write economic development policy. Many of the small business incentives on the books today in Nebraska, I wrote, my colleagues wrote, and got passed at the Center for Rural Affairs. And lastly, you know, I spent the last seven, 18, 17 years, 18 years running things. Um, I helped run the biggest public institution in this state, the University of Nebraska, the most important public institution. Um, and I ran my own, multi er, I ran a, as executive director of a multi-million dollar nonprofit organization, the Center for Rural Affairs. So every year I had to make decisions about what good things that we wanted to do and, and could make a good case to do, we couldn't do, wouldn't do because we couldn't afford them. Um, I made decisions about staffing, mm -hmm. I made decisions about how to make things work, and that's fundamentally the job of the governor. So I think um, I come prepared for this job. All right. Well, you know, unfortunately, though, we here in this part of the state realize the importance of agriculture to uh, Nebraska, we perhaps don't understand as much about it as uh, some of the people who live uh, further west of us. Uh, so. I wonder if you could tell me just a little bit more about the Center for Rural Affairs and, and what all sorts of things that organization does and you know where it comes from, its funding, that sort of thing. Well, the Center for Rural Affairs is a nonprofit organization uh -huh. and it's really an advocate to, to strengthen and maintain the small town and rural way of life. So we fought to strengthen our state's family farms. Um, you know, when you read about farm bill debates, typically the big issue typically in, in the farm bill debate is whether or not uh, farm program payments are going to be capped or whether or not they're going to, the policy is going to be the bigger and richer you get in farming, mm -hmm. the more money you get from the government and then use that money to drive family farms out of business. So we wrote the, the policy to, to cap those uh, payments. We, we haven't gotten it passed yet, but it's the center of the farm bill debate again. We worked at state policy uh, and the federal level on economic development policy and then we were really involved out across the state of Nebraska helping link uh, beginning farmers with retiring farmers to give young people a chance to get started on the land, and particularly in microenterprise. Um, we, the Center for Rural Affairs runs the nation's largest and premier rural microenterprise development program, and uh, in fact our program, even though it's spread, our service area was 500 miles long, wide, um, was one of the top 10 SBA micro lenders in America, including programs and big cities that had more clients in a mile than we had in 500 miles. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are more potential clients in a mile than we had in 500 miles. So um, the center is an organization I'm very proud of. It's had an impact in creating opportunity for people in Nebraska. That's great. And, and we know that because of the distribution of uh, registration between the various different parties, 
uh, we Democrats struggled in the western part of the state. And from what I know, you're very well known because of your work through the Center for Rural Affairs out in the western part of the state, and that could be very important to, uh, to your campaign. Well, well, part of what I want to do as governor is um, make state government work to create genuine opportunity for every Nebraskan in every community. Um, from the Missouri River in Omaha to the North Platte River in the Panhandle. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one of the things I bring that I'm uniquely qualified to do is to talk about how government can work better to create a future in rural Nebraska. Oh, great. Well, based on uh, the background that we've discussed, uh, what would you uh, have as your major goals uh, as, as governor? What would you hope to accomplish? My, my overarching goal is to create good jobs and, and genuine opportunity for every Nebraska and every community. And I focus on that because our state can only achieve its full potential um, if every one of our neighbors in every one of our communities, and whether they're across the street or across the state, uh, if every one of them have the opportunity to achieve their potential. So um, it starts with education. Um, I think one of the most important places for us to invest in Nebraska is in early childhood education. You know, we have too many kids in Nebraska now who start kindergarten already so far behind that the odds are against them succeeding in school. And we all have a stake in fixing that because if they don't succeed in school, um, they're probably not going to contribute to our state's so prosperity. Right. They're probably going to cost us in the future. So I, I think the best long-term investment we can make in our future is expanding early childhood education to give every Nebraska child the opportunity to start kindergarten prepared to succeed. Um, we need to, to expand job training. You know, we have many families in Nebraska in low-wage jobs, and then we have good jobs going unfilled. Um, jobs where, with a year or two of technical training in welding or uh, diesel mechanics or writing code for programming, a person can go from making 12 bucks an hour to fifty, sixty, sure. seventy thousand dollars a year. So I want to work with our employers, uh, our high schools, or community colleges to really gear up job training. I want to develop our win. Nebraska has the third greatest potential of any state in the union to generate electricity from wind. But yet we're way behind our neighbors. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get in your car in the front range of the Rocky Mountains and you drive across the plains of eastern Colorado, across Nebraska, through western Iowa to Des Moines, where do you see the fused wind turbines? It's in Nebraska, yeah. the state with the best yeah. wind. And that really reflects a lack of leadership. And it's, it's costing us not only thousands of good jobs, it's costing us hundreds of millions um, in landowner payments and uh, local, uh, local tax revenue that could be used for education and property tax relief. Um, and, and finally, I, just, I, I think we have to put more emphasis in our economic development on entrepreneurship and small business. You know, Nebraska does so much to attract large employers. Um, but still, most new jobs come from small business. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've, over my years, I've worked to create a number of innovative programs and in state policy to tax credits for small business uh, uh, pro grant programs to help uh, support loans and uh, training and, and help with business planning for small businesses. But all of those programs are kind of funded at a very low level, you know, and we'll spend hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, a year on incentives for large businesses to move to Nebraska, but when it comes to a tax credit to help a small business grow or get started, it's capped at maybe $2 million a year yeah. for all small yeah. businesses. So um, I, I want to take small business from being an afterthought in our economic development policy to being a priority. Okay. Well, that sounds like a very good, very ambitious program. You know, many times people rely on these tags such as liberal or conservative to describe uh, politicians, and it's really not very useful most times. How would you describe your approach to uh, government and facing the problems and challenges that face Nebraska and the nation? Well, you know, my approach is to focus on creating opportunity and on fixing problems. And, you know, because I think that's what state government has to do. State government works best when we take a practical approach uh, to make life better for people as opposed to a real ideological approach. So, um, you know, the, and the most important thing I think a state can do is open up opportunity to all of its people. And that's why I'm so focused on things like education and entrepreneurship and renewable energy development, because they create opportunity for people who need opportunity. Yeah. And if we give people good, oppor genuine opportunity at every level, we give young people a chance to get off to a good start with a good education, and we give people the opportunity to gain the skills they need and the education they need to succeed in the 21st century, 
Um, we can provide, we can offer that kind of genuine opportunity yeah. to all of our people. And I think that fits well, despite the partisan divisions we have. I think at base, Nebraskans are pretty pragmatic people, wouldn't you, don't you? Oh, I think Nebraskans are very practical, pragmatic people. And, I, you know, in fact, um, you know, if you look at our legislature today, even though um, most of the seats are held by Republicans, the, the balance of power is held, really held by a moderate coalition. Mm -hmm. And that's good. That's good. Because yeah. that's what makes our legislature work while Washington exactly. is failing abysmally. Exactly. Exactly. Well, we've mentioned some specific issues, but I'd like to touch on uh, some of the others. Mm -hmm. You know, the legislature's uh, special committee studying uh, the tax structure on the state wound up uh, finding that the system was basically sound and they made only relatively minor suggestions for changing uh, directed mostly at property tax. And yet the governor has come back again on top of his proposal the last go around for sweeping changes uh, to the tax system and now further uh, emphasizing the income tax. What is your approach and what do you feel should be done with our tax system? Well, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of radical change in our tax system. I think you know, we have a problem in our tax system with property taxes. The property tax yeah. is the most burdensome tax in, in Nebraska, and, and we need to address that. I mean, you look for practical ways to address that. Um, I don't agree with cutting the top income tax rate. I don't think that should be a priority, in part because when you make that a priority, you always end up pushing more costs down to local government, more costs on the schools, and, and more taxes onto the... And I thought it was government. interesting that the governor said the reason that the property taxes are going up is because local governments are spending too much. But one of the problems we have is that uh, Nebraska has frequently been criticized because we don't give enough aid to our local uh, governments, particularly uh, the schools. Well, and, and they have, in turn, have to turn to more property taxes. And in fact, what's happened is when when state elected officials want to get credit for a tax cut, they cut taxes and they but they cut aid to local government and push push more of the tax and more of the pain down. Exactly. exactly. Um, so I think we have to stop doing that. That's one of the first things we have to do on property taxes. And then we have to look for new sources of revenue to, mm -hmm. to help lighten the burden on property taxes. One of the reasons I'm so excited about wind development is you know that every wind turbine over its 20 year life will pay about $100,000 mm -hmm. in local taxes. And if you have a wind farm with 300 turbines, that's a lot of, that's a lot of property tax that can take the place of. Um, I think we also have to at least consider some other options. You know, for example, if I, um, I'm a woodworker, if I go um, across town and buy a new table saw um, here in Nebraska, I'm going to pay a, a sales tax for it, and that's fine. But if I go online and buy it from out of state, I don't pay any tax. Well, I, I think that's unfair to our local merchants. Um, and now there's some recent court rulings say that we can't address that, we can charge sales tax. Um, on firms like Amazon and eBay, and so um, there's probably $40 million to raise there, if we can raise $40 million there and use it to uh, to do property tax relief, but the property tax relief focus on modest income homeowners and family farmers and ranchers, that would be my priority. Okay. Well, what about uh, health care, the Affordable Care Act, and more specifically the expansion of Medicaid in Nebraska? Well, I, mean, I support the expansion of Medicaid. Um, well, what we've done at this point, where the expansion of Medicaid has been blocked by a minority in the legislature and the governor, uh, gives Nebraska the worst of both worlds. You know, we're paying federal taxes mm -hmm. uh, to, to expand Medicaid, to provide for the medical care of low-wage workers in New York and California and Chicago and places like that. Um, but our low-wage workers aren't benefiting. And so they can't afford insurance, though. So when they need health care, they have to go to the emergency room and get health care there, and they can't pay for it. So we pay a second time. We pay in higher, those of us who have insurance pay a second time in higher insurance premiums uh, to pay for the uncompensated care of low-wage workers who can't afford insurance but should be on Medicaid but exactly. are being denied Medicaid. So um, I strongly support expanding Medicaid. I think it's the, the right thing to do to give people who go to work and work full-time every week and every day um, they should have access to health care for their family. I think it's interesting how the opponents of expansion of Medicaid always talk about the stress on the federal debt that uh, they might see and the possibility that the uh, federal government might, they might not be able to come through with the funding they promise under the Affordable Care Act, yet they never seem to focus on that back end of that additional cost that you just mentioned with the, through the emergency uh, uh, centers and, and things like this that uh, 
will come back and cost us uh, in the end. Well, and Medicaid expansion is a is a perfect example of we're doing uh, we're lending a helping hand to low wage workers. It's not only good for them; it's good for all of us. It's good for all of us who pay health insurance because when we don't lend them that helping hand, the cost of their care gets shifted onto us. So, what's good for that low wage worker is also good for that middle class family who's uh, struggling to keep paying the cost of their health yeah. insurance. Say nothing of the fact that uh, so many of these people are going without health care insurance today and the governor's program and other people's, other opponents of affordable, the Affordable Care Act seem to have no answer for those people who find themselves in that gap. Yeah, and I, you know, this, one of the challenges we need to address as state government is to ensure that we do have affordable insurance in Nebraska. And one of the other mistakes that, that was made at the state level of Nebraska, uh, I think by our current governor, is in failing to implement our own health insurance exchange. Um, you know, we all know read the horror stories about the federal exchange not getting up on time, not working. Well, we should have known Nebraskans could have done that better yeah. at, a, at a much more manageable scale. Sure. Nebraskans get things like that done. But furthermore, if we set up our own exchange, we could make it an active exchange. Mm -hmm. Because right now what the federal government has is an exchange where insurers just go and kind of post or advertise their prices. If we set up our own exchange, we could make it an active exchange that negotiates for better rates. Uh, for our, for Nebraskans with insurers, so that we could say to our insurers, we have a hundred thousand Nebraskans on the exchange, and we could say just like a big corporation would say, we have a hundred thousand Nebraskans, who's going to give us the best price uh, to get their business? Exactly, um, right. and that's what we should be doing. We should be using the cloud of the hundred thousand Nebraskans on the exchange to negotiate better premiums with insurers who are making very good returns on their investment. Right? Chuck, we've talked about economic development, we've talked about an emphasis on uh, improvements in the educational system. I'd just like to ask if there are other issues you think that will be important in this campaign and that you're concerned about and you would uh, pay attention to as, as governor. Well, you know, I, I think we've, tried, we've really touched on the most important issues, but uh, I mean, as to make state government work in Nebraska and to really make sure that we continue to have the good life in Nebraska, it's critical that we have state government that focus on creating a better future for our kids and grandkids and making those investments um, and looking out beyond what's easiest today um, toward what's best in the long term. You know, one of the reasons we enjoy the good life in Nebraska is because our parents and grandparents sacrificed. They sacrificed to build schools. And they were a lot poorer than we, you know, they were poor and we have it easy compared to them, but they sacrificed to build schools and make life better for us. And we have to remember that we have a responsibility to the next generation to do the same, to pass it on and pass it forward. Exactly. Well, I can't let this uh, session end without asking a few political type questions, or at least one political question. The, barring some unforeseen circumstance, you will be the Democratic nominee. Yet on the Republican side, there's a host of candidates that are running. Uh, do you have any comments about the slate of the potential opponents who might be the, the most formidable or uh, any comments about that, that slate of, of candidates? No, no, not really. I mean, I think it's really up to the Republican voters in Nebraska to decide who their candidate is. And, and uh, I'm ready for any one of them. I, I think um, I would say that um, I don't take any one of them lightly. Um, and on the other hand, I believe that I can defeat every one of them. And so um, I look forward to a, a spirited contest in the fall. And what I most hope is a spirited and thoughtful debate about the future of our state and how we make our state a better place that offers good jobs and genuine opportunity and a good life to, to every one of our children and grandchildren. Well, I certainly say that I must uh, say that I also look forward to a very spirited campaign and having the opportunity to hear you speak at other times as well as this opportunity. I'm, I'm uh, very optimistic about your chances in the, in the campaign, and I certainly know that all of us here in Sarpy County wish you all the best, and we will be uh, helping as, as we can in, in your campaign. Chuck, it's been a real pleasure to have you with us today on uh, Sarpy Outlook. We want to thank you. and. We thank you all for visiting Sarpy Outlook and viewing our program. Thanks so much for having me.